Whiskey is for drinking. Water is for fighting over. This scrappy pronouncement is attributed to Mark Twain. Even he would have had trouble imagining it would one day apply to a place not far from where Huck and Jim floated downstream to the river-rich southeastern United States. In the Florida panhandle at the mouth of the Apalachicola River, Bevan Putnell has been harvesting oysters for 50 years. It's important that we get water year-round to keep this bay going and keep it profitable. Joe O'Grady lives in Seal, Alabama, but every day he drives to Columbus, Georgia. He works at a large Kodak plant that uses millions of gallons of water to make printing plates. Water is extremely important. It's important for us now to sustain us, and it's important for our future and our kids' future. Sally Bethay heads up river to monitor dissolved oxygen levels at the mouth of Peachtree Creek just below where the city of Atlanta draws its water supply. It's a liquid lifeline, this river is, for millions of people. And for me personally, it's the place I grew up. Although they've never met, these three individuals are unwittingly part of a conflict that pits their home states against one another. For 20 years, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama have been locked in a bitter rivalry over one river basin. A severe drought followed by a court ruling that the judge himself calls draconian has brought this long simmering water war to a head. The source of this conflict that has cost millions of dollars in lawsuits begins as a beautiful spring, cascading through the wooded slopes of the North Georgia mountains, the Chattahoochee. The mountain stream is soon captured in the first and largest of four federal reservoirs, Lake Lanier. Below Lanier, the Chattahoochee, now a river, passes through the heart of Metro Atlanta. It heads southwest until it's slowed again by a second large federal reservoir, West Point Lake. From there, the river turns south past Columbus, forming the border between Georgia and Alabama. A third federal dam, Walter F. George, slows its progress. Meanwhile, to the east, the Chattahoochee's largest tributary, the Flint, flows through the agricultural heart of Georgia. Above Jim Woodruff, the final federal dam, the Chattahoochee and the Flint converge. Under its new name, Apalachicola, the river heads across Florida to the Gulf of Mexico, where it ends its 530-mile journey. I call the Chattahoochee a blue-collar river. And by that, I mean, you know, this river does a lot of things for many interest groups. It's where over six million people get their water supply and send their wastewater. It generates electricity and provides cooling for coal, gas, and nuclear power stations. It supports agriculture, industry, recreation, and aquatic life. It belongs to everybody, those living upstream and those living down. Almost all of us are downstream of somebody else. And the way Eastern Water Law was set up is you can use the water, but you're supposed to send it on downstream in the same quality that you got it, so the guy downstream of you can use it. But those downstream worry that their share is dwindling due to rapid growth upstream in Metro Atlanta. Meanwhile, upstreamers fear that a judge's ruling may deprive them of a significant portion of the supply they've grown to depend on. As demands for water increase, 
sharing it only gets harder. This film looks at how individuals and communities up and down this 19,000 square mile river basin are striving to come to terms with the new reality of water in the southeast. Apalachicola Bay is journey's end for the 500-mile-long river. Here it merges with the sparkling waters of the Gulf of Mexico through a man-made cut across the dazzling white sands of St. George's Island. So far, this stretch of coast has been spared the devastating effects of the BP oil spill. But a different threat hangs over it. This is one of the front lines in the water war. In early June, an armada of small boats heads out into Apalachicola Bay. The oyster beds opened a week ago, and there's money to be made. Now I'm telling you, and she's, she's curling them. She's separating them. But uh, this is Tony right here. Eugene King and his wife, Deline, are harvesting oysters. She sorts and cleans the catch while he brings it on board. No See, so when I pull them out and I'm spreading them, and uh, just kind of filling the oysters down there, some muddy bottom. And uh, you, can, uh, you can feel the oysters down there. It's a good way to make a living. I've been doing it for 50 years, and uh, I enjoy it. I'm teaching my young boys now to just get fishing to get out of school. I'm teaching him how, them how to do it so that they'll be able to do it when they get out of school, if they want to. But Bevan Putnell is afraid his grandsons may not have that opportunity. The oyster beds and Apalachicola Bay itself are in trouble. We came close to a tipping point where that ecosystem begins to unravel. Um, you know, we had like 80% of the oyster beds in the bay uh, died off during that almost seven months of flatlined low flows in the river. In 2007, those low flows in the Apalachicola River were brought on when the worst drought in 50 years hit this part of the southeast. Well, when the drought was here, they were just shells everywhere. Shells, shells, shells. Up north side of the bridge, probably 200 boats a day work up there. And I don't, I don't think I see but one up there right now. As the flow of the Apalachicola River fell, salinity levels shot up in the bay. When you get too much salt, it's bad. If you don't get what they need, they just pop open and die. And it's a waste. If they get what they need, and, and this little bit of rain we've had, see all these little bitty oysters? These little bitty oysters? That's because of all that rain we had. They're starting to grow like a, like a garden in the spring. Yeah. Fortunately, in 2009, the drought finally releases its grip. The spring rains give Bevan Putnell and the oystermen of Apalachicola Bay hope that the oyster beds they depend on will recover. Oysters may be the most important commercial species for the region, but they're just one part of a highly productive ecosystem. And the way the whole ecosystem functions is we get the floods in the winter and spring, and the floodplain is inundated, and the river picks up the nutrients and brings it down here to the bay. And that combination is what makes the bay one of the most productive bays in North America. Let me swing in front of you so that I'm facing. Owl Creek is part of the vast floodplain that feeds Apalachicola Bay. Dan Tonsmeyer is with the environmental organization Apalachicola Riverkeeper. He's here to see the results of the recent flooding firsthand. 
He joins longtime river observer Steve Lightman. I grew up on the Los Angeles River. I lived a block away from what has to be one of the ugliest rivers in the world. <laughs> it's just, you know, if you saw the movie The Terminator and the cement walls, that's the Los Angeles River and the tributaries or, you know, the sewer pipes that flow into it. And so I've seen how bad it can get. And I think that some of my interest in rivers and protecting them goes back to being a kid and seeing what can be done to rivers. The Apalachicola floodplain is a biological hotspot, a place where species from the Atlantic and the Gulf, the mountains and the coastal plain converge. Many of these species are plants, including the largest stand of tupelo trees east of the Mississippi, renowned for the honey they produce. If you come out here in the spring and you get in these enclosed areas, the bees will be working the tupelo, and it's almost like being inside a beehive. The knowledge Steve Lightman has gathered from 20 years of paddling the river serves a bigger purpose. At Florida State University, he teaches a course in water management. So remember the previous week's assessment where you looked at what the importance of this was to the ACF basin? The challenge his students must grapple with plunges them into the very heart of the water war. How to manage the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint River Basin as a whole, serving everyone from oystermen in the south to Atlanta residents in the north. If someone thinks they can understand this right away, they're deceiving themselves. With the 20,000 square miles, the multiple stakeholders, and the multiple issues, it really takes a time to put your arms around all the issues and understand it. It's complex. A key piece of that complex puzzle is the Jim Woodruff Dam. Straddling the Georgia-Florida line, it's the last of the four big federal dams on the Chattahoochee River. They're operated by the U.S. Corps of Engineers. Right, we got one unit making 13 and a half, the other one making about 12 and a half, we're making about 26. Some of the water passing through the dam spins two large turbines, generating 26 megawatts of electricity. Most of it goes to power homes in Tallahassee, Florida's capital. But the main function of Woodruff Dam is to regulate the flow south into the Apalachicola. The recent spring rains have turned it into a raging torrent. 21,000 cubic feet per second. Over 13 billion gallons a day. Enough to satisfy all the daily water needs of Georgia and Florida combined. But at the height of the drought, the rate was cut below 5,000 cubic feet per second, barely a quarter of today's flow. Steve Lightman explains the tensions this produces to one of his students. The problem you have is, is that at medium flow, in a situation like we are now, there's plenty of water for everyone. But the question is, how do you manage when you get to the extreme lows? And how do we share water when we get to the extreme lows? And so we're going into sort of unprecedented territory. That unprecedented territory worries the oystermen of Apalachicola Bay. They see their livelihoods threatened not just by drought, but also the increasing thirst of Georgia's capital. A long time ago, Atlanta should have looked into finding these water sources and tapping into them and, and had a plan for water shortages, but they didn't. Every time they uh, pull water out of that river and don't let it come down here, yesterday, they're taking my livelihood. The drought certainly heightens everyone's awareness. You know, Atlanta was running out of water, so to speak, and river levels were low everywhere. The farmers were having to irrigate extensively. Everything got worse. Things might have got worse still if it hadn't been for an endangered species clinging to life in this river basin. Above Woodruff Dam in Lake Seminole, the Chattahoochee River converges with its largest tributary, the Flint. It rises as a tiny stream 200 miles north under a runway at Atlanta's Hartsfield-Jackson Airport. 
But unlike the Chattahoochee, for much of its length, the Flint isn't constrained by dams. It's one of the longest wild rivers left in the country. And it supports a large variety of aquatic life. Along the stretch near Newton, Georgia, ecologists are conducting a survey for freshwater mussels. Purple bank climber. <laughs> Their Florida cousins made headlines in 2007 during the drought, when their endangered status ensured a minimum flow of 5,000 cubic feet per second in the Apalachicola River. Metro Atlanta residents angrily protested that releasing Lake Lanier's dwindling water supply was pitting man against muscle. The issue really isn't people versus muscles, it's um, the benefits that healthy streams and rivers provide beyond water supply, including recreational benefits, uh, the ability to assimilate waste from municipal and industrial discharges. And that's really the issue. And the solution to that is reasonable water use and conservation. Yeah, that's a really nice one. Mussels aren't the enemy, because like oysters, they're filter feeders, improving water quality as they draw it through their bodies. While mussels and other aquatic species help keep the Flint's waters clean, the river faces pressures of its own. It's late June in Seminole County, tucked away in the southwest corner of Georgia. 50 migrant workers from Mexico swarm on and around a large piece of machinery, part tractor, part conveyor. On the ground, pickers strip off ears of sweet corn. Others stand on wings, sprouting from each side, packing the corn into crates. This carefully choreographed ballet of man and machinery aims to bring food to market in time for a key holiday. We're fortunate in this area that the best growing season corresponds with the best marketing season, which is right before July 4th. For the last two weeks of June, we grow all the sweet corn for the eastern half of the country. What we're trying to do is get the insecticide down to get the uh, worms just down behind the ear. Besides insecticide, what Glenn Hurd and his fellow farmers need to make a good crop is water. Lots of it. Inch of water on an acre of land is about 27,000 gallons. When you multiply 27,000 gallons times 20 times thousands of acres, this is a lot of water. Over the 60 day growing season, Glenn Hurd's 1,000 acres of sweet corn will consume over 400 million gallons more than half the water Metro Atlanta residents use in a day. So where does all this water come from? The Flint River is one source, but an even larger river flows underground. Occasionally in places like Radium Springs, south of Albany, this immense pool of groundwater wells up to the surface tinged blue by dissolved minerals. This water comes from the Floridan Aquifer, a layer of porous limestone under South Georgia and Florida that soaks up rainwater like a giant sponge. There's a lot of water. It's a, it's a very large aquifer system that's probably one of the most prolific aquifers in the U.S. To tap that rich supply of water for thirsty crops, farmers have resorted to irrigation on a grand scale. It's called center pivot. Water pumped from a central well at a rate of 1,500 gallons a minute flows outward inside a metal pipe. This long pipe, sometimes carried over nine or 10 spans, slowly pivots or walks its wheels in a giant circle as it sprays water on the crop. 
During dry summers in the lower Flint Basin, over 6,000 center pivot units can pour as much as half a billion gallons a day onto valuable cash crops like cotton, peanuts, and pecans. But that productivity may come at a price, especially in times of drought. If we think about our water supply, both in our streams and our aquifers as a bank account, we're putting a fixed amount into the bank account, and then all of a sudden we start taking more money out of the bank account without adding more money in, and it's bound to have an effect. To head off the threat of pumping restrictions, as well as rising energy costs, farmers are devising new ways to make water go further. Drop nozzles apply the water directly to the crops. An end gun shutoff can prevent water being wasted on the roads. But new technology can apply water to fields even more precisely. Steve Singletary is one of 20 farmers pioneering the technique. He inserts a computer disk into a center pivot control panel. It contains a customized watering program specially designed for this field. In the future, he'll be able to start the program remotely from his computer back in the office. It's called variable rate irrigation. So if you get a sandy place in the field, you put out water faster because it'll absorb it faster. If you get in a hard red place, to keep the water from running off and washing in the field and losing the water, you put it out at a slower rate. With the help of this system, Steve is growing a better crop using less water. Others, like Glenn Hurd, are starting to adopt the technology. We know that we need this water to keep going on and on and on. I mean, we want to be productive uh, for generations to come. West of the Flint flows the main stem of the river, the Chattahoochee itself. This middle section starts below West Point Dam, the second of the big federal reservoirs that dominate the basin. Its largest city is Columbus, also the northern limit for navigation on the river. You'd think if there's a front line anywhere in the water war, this would be it. For over 150 miles, the Chattahoochee runs along the border between Georgia and Alabama. In fact, the original 1802 document establishing the border places it on the western bank. That's to the right of this bridge on the Alabama side, rather than in the center of the river. Hardly a friendly gesture between states. But in practice, the river seems to bind people more than it separates them. We have the same interest. And the Tri-River Waterways is my organization. I'm the executive director. We have our membership is made up of Georgia, Floridians, and Alabama. People that live in Phoenix City work in Columbus and vice versa, crossing back and forth on a daily basis. People like Joe O'Grady, Driving from his home in Alabama to work in Georgia every day, he tries to keep a positive attitude. Because it's easy to get caught up into the struggle with, this is mine, this is yours. But in all, all reasonable thoughts, the water is everybody's. And, and we definitely have to make sure it's always going to be there as a vital resource that it is. Water is certainly vital to the large Kodak plant where Joe O'Grady works. He's among the 20% of the workforce that commute here daily from Alabama. Special low lighting protects the product they make. About 20 years ago, we were looking for a facility location where we had plenty of good water, and the Columbus area next to the Chattahoochee River fit the bill. Here at this facility, we make aluminum lithographic printing plates. Those printing plates could be used for newspapers, magazines, advertising, all types of printed packaging. Manufacturing those printing plates starts with a large spool of aluminum. An image sensitive coating is applied to the aluminum as it passes through a series of chemical baths and rinses. 
The process uses eight to nine million gallons of water a month, making Kodak Columbus's second largest water user. And so it became a very strong focus here at the plant to look at ways that we could reduce water usage in our existing operations. A 40% saving recently allowed the plant to add a new production line without the need for more water. Kodak's conservation effort goes beyond the factory walls. As environmental manager, Joe O'Grady's job is to monitor the storm water that flows off the plant roof and surrounding property. It drains into what looks like a wetland, but it's actually a retention pond. And this retention pond, what it does is it essentially, during a rainstorm, holds the water for a 72-hour period to allow solids to settle out to the bottom, and then the remainder water wears over into our rivers and community lakes. Because we're using so much water, it's good to be able to make sure that we're giving back properly, and that it's going back clean. Without a lot of clean water, you wouldn't see this in downtown Columbus. In the summer, Bill Wickham and his son come to ride the waves. White water kayaking. We've got a nice class four wave, right through a whole series of waves through here. The short stretch of white water is created when hydropower is generated upriver. Now there's a plan to make it better. They're going to remove two dams upstream. They're two old dams, 100 years old at least. We'll have a two and a half mile class three, class four rafting and whitewater course. If all goes to plan, Columbus will be the only major city in the US to have an Olympic class whitewater run through downtown. Below Columbus, another federal dam turns the Chattahoochee River once again into a lake. Walter F. George, or to most locals, Lake Eufaula, named after the small Alabama town on its western shore. Eufaula builds itself as the big bass capital of the world, with tournament prizes worth up to $50,000. Scott Montgomery has won respectable money here, but his real business is developing successful lures for champions. It's really nice to be able to come out and take a lure that these guys can go all over the United States with, and you really can make sure it's, it's going to catch those five or six pounders that they need in the tournament. So. One of the lake's biggest promoters is Billy Houston. We love it. We love the use of it from the basic necessary uses of, of, of living in a, in a house, the way you use it, to the recreation component of it. But in his view, none of it would be here without navigation, one of the original reasons why Congress built the dams in the first place. Navigation provides the water for a lot of our recreation. Navigation provides the water for a lot of our industry use. One of those industries is the Farley Nuclear Power Plant, which supplies almost 20% of Alabama's electricity. It doesn't depend on commercial barge traffic to deliver supplies, but it does count on the river for plenty of water. To cool its two nuclear reactors, it has to withdraw 100 million gallons a day. The cooling system at Farley has to have that continuous flow and that depth. Uh, they have, uh, you know, they have serious, serious concerns. In spite of the summer heat, his new lure seems a success. The fish are biting. But Scott Montgomery still worries about lake levels in the future. For the fishery to stay as well as it is right now, they're going to have to keep this lake near full pool at all times to keep everything healthy, to keep the tourists coming in, to keep everybody coming to, to Eufaula. In the middle Chattahoochee, people from Georgia and Alabama share similar interests when it comes to water. They want to enjoy the benefits of a full and now much cleaner river. So we find ourselves in an odd position here as downstream Georgians. We're at odds a lot of the time politically as far as the water issues with North Georgia, which includes Metro Atlanta.
Members of the Lake Lanier Sailing Club get ready for the fall regattas. Club Commodore Michael Lenkite helps some late arrivals get launched. Uh, I've been around the club basically my whole life. My family joined the sailing club in the mid-60s, and so I basically was born into the club and grew up with my parents racing every weekend. Good luck out there. All right, hey, thanks. More than any lake on the Chattahoochee, Lanier, because it contains 65% of the storage capacity for the basin, has been a flashpoint in the water war. Buford Dam, the dam that created it, was built in the 1950s. Atlanta Mayor William Hartsfield was a big supporter, but Hartsfield and Atlanta decided not to help pay for the massive project. They believed the additional water supply that would soon pour through the spillway tunnels wasn't a priority for the city. So the U.S. Congress alone appropriated the $43 million the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers needed to complete the dam. And when the Corps began operations, it was with three authorized purposes. Flood control, navigation, and the real moneymaker, hydropower. Well, when it was built, hydropower was one of the major functions. And it is our job to try to balance and manage the system as best as possible with the amount of water that's available to meet those authorizations given to us by Congress. Most afternoons around 4 p.m., the turbines at Buford Dam spin up to provide peaking power. As Metro Atlanta commuters head home, it helps meet the surge in demand for electricity as they cook dinner take showers, and turn on a host of modern appliances. But in the 50 years since the lake was first filled, demands on its water have steadily mounted. Well, the other thing that makes Lake Lanier a little bit different than other lakes is the fact that it's located basically in the center of a major metropolitan area. So it does get a tremendous amount of visitation. And this lake typically is in the top five nationally. Some seven and a half million visitors a year flock to Lake Lanier, posing an extra challenge for sailboat races. It's a lot more crowded, there's more people fighting for the space, so it's harder to find a, a limited section of the lake that we can exclusively use for a race, because there's fishing tournaments, there's people that want to water ski, and there's a lot more just competition for the general space out on the lake. All those visitors with boats need somewhere to keep them and fuel them up. Many choose the marina run by Len Jernigan. Alkaline is the largest inland marina in the world, as well as being the largest floating marina in the United States. Aqualand has uh, over 1,600 wet slips and 450 boats of dry storage. Aqualand's labyrinth of docks can accommodate everything from slim 20-foot sailboats to hulking 100-foot houseboats, which offer the ultimate in floating entertainment. Along the shoreline are million-dollar homes with their own private docks. There are hundreds of thousands of people that live here whose property values are influenced by the lake. There are businesses, and to sort of visualize what this area would be like without Lake Lanier is sort of mind-boggling. The majority of those drawn to the area also depend on it for their water supply. Gwinnett County's Shoal Creek filtration plant is one of two that together process about 85 million gallons of water a day to satisfy Gwinnett's 800,000 plus residents. All of Gwinnett's water that we take for water supply comes from Lake Lanier. The water from Lake Lanier is excellent quality water. There's very little solids to it, no metals, low bacteria counts. Whatever impurities remain are removed through a series of treatments. Every step is monitored and samples are tested to ensure quality. The finished water is stored in two 10 million gallon clear wells, ready for distribution. 
Most of the time, Lake Lanier's sprawling 38,000 acres can meet all these demands, unless something unusual happens. In 2006, the worst drought in 50 years strikes the region, bringing long, festering differences in the water war back to the surface. The crux of the situation is back in the uh, late 80s, the, we were asked, the Corps, was asked to look at the possibility of uh, uh, reallocating water from Lake Lanier from a hydropower function to a water supply function. When the other states and the other stakeholders throughout the basin looked at that, they raised tremendous concerns that it didn't adequately address what the effects would be downstream. Alabama and Florida contend that too much water is being reallocated to the Atlanta region, and the states have been in a standoff ever since. In the absence of any agreement, only one minimum flow level exists. At Woodruff Dam on the Florida line, the Corps of Engineers must supply 5,000 cubic feet per second of flow to protect the endangered species of mussels in the Apalachicola River. As the drought intensifies in 2007, only one source can still meet this requirement. Lake Lanier had the only bucket of water left to discharge down the Chattahoochee into the Apalachicola. When full, the surface of Lake Lanier stands at 1,071 feet above sea level. As the lake level steadily drops throughout the summer of 2007, docks are left high and dry. Len Jernigan sees 25% of the slips in his marina, some of which rent for $1,200 a month, become unusable. And then this is a prime example. This is what we call our North Basin. And then this shot, you see a spit of land sticking out here that should be covered by over 10 feet of water. On December 16, 2007, Lake Lanier hits an all-time low of 1,050 feet, 20 feet below full pool. By then, releases from Buford Dam to meet the minimum flow at the Florida line have been cut back. The drought itself won't ease for at least another year. When the rains finally come, they're swiftly followed by a new crisis. On July 17, 2009, federal judge Paul Magnuson rules that water supply is not an authorized purpose for Lake Lanier. What this means is, unless Georgia can do what it's failed to do in 20 years, reach an agreement with its neighbors, and persuade Congress to reauthorize the federal lake for water supply, then in 2012, 3.5 million people in metro Atlanta could lose a third to half of the water they depend on. It's a ruling the judge himself calls draconian. If it were not so serious, it would be laughable, I guess, would be the best way to, to, to state it. I mean, and it's perfectly understandable. If you live here, your interest is here. You don't pay any attention to interests 500 miles downstream. Same thing with the folks downstream, don't pay any attention to the folks up here. They think the folks up here are just hogging all the water and they're not getting it downstream. So I think the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Atlanta probably needs to do more, the counties need to do more. On the flip side, there needs to be some easement of the original restrictions to say, hey, you've had this water source for this long. In all of Metro Atlanta, Gwinnett County stands most squarely in the crosshairs of Judge Magnuson's decision. Its two filter plants withdraw water directly from Lake Lanier. With its sprawling strip malls and subdivisions, it's hardly a place renowned for smart growth. Yet even before the judge's ruling, Gwinnett has begun taking an innovative step in the way it handles water. A mile east of Buford Dam, a huge section of steel pipe is on its way out to a deep water construction site. A 100 foot piece of this 72 inch pipe weighs approximately 64,000 pounds as it's sitting right now. We'll get our rigging on there, get it leveled out to our right attitude and then we'll install it in the water. It's part of an ambitious plan to put almost half the water Gwinnett currently withdraws from Lake Lanier back into the lake itself. 
At the end of this pipe, there'll be a diffuser, and this is supposed to be bringing water from uh, wastewater plants that's already treated back into the lake. Good to go, Woody. Good to go. But before the wastewater can be returned, this new mile and a half long underwater discharge pipeline must be installed. Once the next 100 foot section is lowered to the lake bed, a diver must connect it to the pipe already laid. Ready, ready. A challenging task. Yeah, your compressor's on, you got air. What could go wrong is for us to either go beyond the tolerances as far as elevation wise, that could cause problems. You can have air pockets in the pipe, which will restrain the flow. Oh, yeah, I'm ready when you are, both. Diver Jody Igess begins the grueling work of connecting the pipe right, with 50 right. large retaining bolts. You inside the bell? No, Just about. Right inside of it. I'm right on the outside of it right now. At 50 feet, the murky water is a bone chilling 47 degrees. Installing just one piece of pipe takes the divers more than a day. But when complete, the pipeline will benefit the whole basin with the water it returns. Eventually, the new section is bolted in place. I went down, picked up the bolts. Chris had one in already on the top. I went in and put all the rest of those in. It's gonna take a little more adjusting, but from what I understand, we got lightning, so I had to get out. In the wake of the drought and the judge's dramatic ruling, a third scourge of biblical proportions now threatens the region. In fall 2009, heavy rains begin to fall and keep falling. By late September, Atlanta's weather draws national news crews. There has been very little good news for at least seven southeastern states. It's the Chattahoochee River less than a year ago reduced to a parched trickle overruns its banks. And not just by a few feet. This is a 500-year flood that takes lives and drowns homes. Homes like Frank Heal's. They got up yesterday morning, and it was halfway up our yard. We came by at lunch, and it was all the way up. Came home about 3.30 or 4 yesterday, and it was panic time. 24 hours later, the waters are receding, but the damage left behind is now heartbreakingly real. Just the magnitude of cleaning this place up. I can't imagine what this, how they're gonna do it. We're gonna look at all the older equipment. Less than a mile away, Dave St. Pierre faces an even more daunting task. Well, I'll take your best guess right now. He's frantically trying to get Atlanta's R.M. Clayton wastewater online. treatment plant back online. Let's get it online and try to let somebody know as soon as we can. It too was overwhelmed by the Chattahoochee floodwaters. Flood was uh, overcome first. There's a creek that runs along Bowler Road right outside of our gate here. That creek backed up because the river level was so high and we lost the plant. It just started coming in. Cleanup crews and contractors work round the clock to get the Southeast's largest wastewater treatment facility up and running again. In four weeks, Dave St. Pierre hopes to have the plant back at 100% efficiency. But not too long ago, even a modest rain event was enough to send untreated sewage flooding into the Chattahoochee River. In the early 1990s, a newly formed environmental watchdog organization, the Upper Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, set out to change things. Sally Bethay, its director, began monitoring water quality in the Chattahoochee River and the waterways that feed into it. This is Peachtree Creek right here, and it is a major tributary to the Chattahoochee River. It drains all of downtown Atlanta, the streets, buildings, lawns, yards, industry comes flowing through here out into the Chattahoochee River. 
and it's a, a source of a good bit of pollution, stormwater pollution, and used to be a lot of sewage pollution, actually. Back then, Atlanta's water and sewer system, like those in many communities, was aging and in urgent need of improvement. The city was running up millions of dollars in federal fines for water quality violations. So Upper Chattahoochee Riverkeeper decided to sue Atlanta in federal court and won. The task of implementing the extensive court-ordered fixes falls to Atlanta's newly elected mayor. The water initiatives were by far the hardest thing I've ever tried to do uh, in city government. It took daily attention. It took a stomach of steel. Machines of steel, too. To update its water system, the city must embark on a massive construction program. Most of that work goes on deep underground, almost entirely invisible to the community it's designed to benefit. This is the rock, it's called tunnel muck. It's the material that's cut by the tunnel boring machine. The tunnel boring machine is in three miles up the tunnel now, and this is uh, a continuous conveyor system that brings the muck from the cutter head. Like some heaving, writhing monster from hell, one of the world's largest tunnel boring machines devours tons of bedrock beneath Cobb County. The deafening work goes on 24 hours a day, five days a week. A few years ago, this same machine was burrowing a 27-foot diameter hole beneath the streets of Atlanta. Start to, push forward. to clean up its act in water treatment, the city needed to excavate huge tunnels like these for storage. They relieve pressure on the combined sewer overflow system. During heavy rains, storm drains and sewer lines converge, creating a sudden surge of water that can quickly overwhelm a treatment plant. At the same time, the treatment plants themselves have to be updated. We have constructed two brand new state-of-the-art combined sewer overflow treatment facilities to handle that overflow. And up to this rain event, uh, when we went online in November, we had no overflow events and we were treating all of the stormwater that we were receiving, as well as the sewage that uh, was coming through. Improvements like these come at a steep price. Atlanta's water rates rank among the highest in the country. And it is mind-boggling that we've taken on, you know, $4 billion worth of repairs and upgrades to a system, and we're a small city of 500,000 people, but the bottom line is we are a primary user of the Chattahoochee and we have an obligation um, to do our part. But in the middle of that costly effort to improve its infrastructure and image comes the drought. So now all of a sudden water supply, not just water quality, gets raised as an issue and Atlanta has to look at its planning around water supply now. The drought forces people like Midtown resident Eric Bishop to begin thinking seriously about water. For the past 20 years, it's been something that's kind of fought between the states and not fought in people's homes. And that's kind of where we're getting right now. Irrigation systems stop spraying as outdoor watering restrictions take hold. The governor mandates a 10% cut in water use for all of North Georgia. Public fountains are shut down. The July 4th Peachtree Road Race is rerouted to prevent 55,000 runners trampling parched green areas at the finish. Large companies and hotels achieve dramatic savings. Many residents install low-flow toilets and more efficient plumbing fixtures. What we found is that people and businesses really pulled together and we reduced the water use during that period about 20%. In 2010, the Georgia State Legislature passes the Water Stewardship Bill, incorporating many of the conservation and efficiency measures begun during the drought. 
But many experts agree that conservation alone won't slake Atlanta's long-term thirst for water. Simultaneously, we started looking at long-term, what should we do about water supply? So the notion of whether we had sufficient reservoirs and water retention facilities became an issue. This gaping hole on the west side of the city could provide relief in the years ahead. For over a hundred years, granite for Atlanta's buildings and gravel for its roads came from here. Now the quarry has a new purpose. This will be the site of Atlanta's future Bellwood Quarry Reservoir, approximately 2.4 billion gallon water storage facility. That's about 30 days of supply for the city, a valuable backup, but not enough to cope with the next prolonged drought or shortages resulting from the judge's ruling on Lake Lanier. Looking to the future will require a new water vision a radical rethinking of the way Atlanta treats this vital resource. So this is the uh, Fourth Ward Park master plan that we've designed recently. This it's a challenge landscape architect Eric Bishop has been thinking about. Historically, the way we've dealt with water in cities is really, you want to get rid of it as quickly as we can. And it goes all the way back through Roman times. Uh, we've developed infrastructure that brings water to us, and we've built infrastructure that pushes it away as quickly as we can. As part of a nationwide competition, Bishop and a team of architects and urban planners developed a new vision for Atlanta, how it might look a hundred years from now. You know, Atlanta is accused of being a very generic city. Well, this is what we thought Atlanta had that, that made it unique, is that reintroduction of nature, the, the possible reintegration of nature uh, to the urban environment. That vision is embodied in this 3D model of the city's midtown section. The stands of toothpicks represent a new urban forest insinuating its way into the city grid. It's a fresh take on an old idea that Atlanta is a city in a forest. But to sustain that urban forest requires rethinking our view of water. The concept was this, if this is a typical square mile, that we would uh, be able to free up some of the uh, natural watersheds to be opened up to programmed recreational areas and things like that. In fact, the first small step toward realizing that new vision has already been taken. In an abandoned industrial area in Atlanta's old Fourth Ward, construction workers are putting the finishing touches to a new green space, whose master plan was developed by Eric Bishop. When complete, the stormwater pond at the center of the park will drain the area as Clear Creek once did. The long-buried tributary of the Chattahoochee is getting a new lease on life. You know, we're already beginning to look at, you know, some of these natural infrastructure systems being put in the correct places. And once we're able to actually imagine, you know, coexisting with nature in an urban way, then we can really begin to think about how that expands out to the region, the mega region, and kind of throughout the southeast. For the Chattahoochee, a river system that supports over six million souls, Crafting a vision where nature, conservation, technology, and politics can converge may still seem like a Herculean task. But change is coming anyway. Without an agreement between Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, by July 2012, Metro Atlanta stands to lose up to half the water it now draws from Lake Lanier or its outflow. We need part of that lake for water supply, but we don't think there'll be any reallocation or reauthorization until Alabama and Florida feel that Georgia is uh, negotiating in good faith, transparently, and that Metro Atlanta has done absolutely as much as possible to be efficient first. At its core, the water war has always been more of a struggle between Metro Atlanta and the rest of the basin than a contest between the states. So if it's to remain the region's economic engine, Atlanta's only choice is to take the lead. Becoming more efficient is expensive. And greater water efficiency doesn't just mean fixing leaks and installing low-flow plumbing. 
It means figuring out a way to return not just 60%, but 80 to 90% of the water used. If we maximize how much we put back into the water system, that's the key to making sure that somebody downstream has an adequate amount of water to utilize. 20 years of intense focus on water has made this a topic for everyone, not just lawyers and government negotiators. Ordinary people who rely on the river are identifying their needs and must be willing to listen to those of others. Perhaps their voices can persuade the next generation of state leaders to finally reach an agreement on sharing this most precious resource. This program is made possible by the Turner Foundation, the JST Foundation, the Park Foundation, and others. A complete list is at waterwar.org.